from the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Josh Kranzberg in for Jason McClure. No disrespect to Hillary Clinton or the other candidates, but all eyes this election are on Donald Trump. The businessman has demanded nonstop attention since announcing his candidacy in June 2015. His off-the-cuff remarks and cavalier attitude regarding facts has turned him into one of the most polarizing candidates in recent memory, if ever. Gallons and gallons of real and digital ink have been spilled covering his policies, both domestic and foreign. Plenty of outlets have covered Trump in the United States, but today on Global Journalists, we're going to tackle how his candidacy and potential presidency are being viewed around the world. For a look at how Asia feels about a possible President Trump, we'll talk to Jia Jie Tang, the U.S. Bureau Chief for Sina News. For a reaction to Trump's policies regarding the Middle East, we'll be joined by Joyce Karam, Washington Bureau Chief for Al Hayat Newspaper. But first, a breakdown of how Trump would work with Europe, especially in the wake of his comments on NATO. Let's bring in Douglas Herbert, a foreign affairs commentator for France 24. He's joining us from Paris. And from Washington, D.C., Matthias Kolb, a digital correspondent for Süddeutsche Zeitung, Germany's largest daily newspaper. Welcome to both of you to Global Journalist. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So uh, let me start uh, with you guys. You, you've both covered the 2012 election. Um, in a nutshell, how has this been different? Well, if you want me to start there, uh, <laughs> how's this been different? Uh, looking in from uh, the European side here, uh, there is total incomprehension at what's happening right now in the in the U.S. You know, you have, we're coming at this election, uh, and I'm here in France, obviously, in Paris, uh, from a standpoint where Europe is at a state of total uh, sort of convulsion and chaos, uh, going through immigration crises, refugee crises. Uh, you have the far right on the rise across Europe, including here in France with the, the, the National Front. Uh, looking in at this election, you see a man like Donald Trump, who speaks to his, uh, you know, he's speaking to his own base, his own grassroots rank and file Republican base. But everything he says has these absolute seismic uh, consequences across the world. And, and what's interesting is just this week, uh, Francois Hollande, the president here, he, he basically said that, that Trump's outrageous provocative statements as he sees them, he finds them absolutely sickening. They make his stomach turn. And he says all they're really doing is stoking all the anger that's already present here in Europe, making it even worse. He's just stirring the cauldron a little more. And he doesn't really even realize the extent to which he's doing that. Um, so there's really a lot of angst and fear here playing into the hands of the far right. Marina Le Pen, who's the leader of the far right, the, the flag bearer of that party, basically saying uh, already publicly she would vote for Donald Trump way before Hillary Clinton. Uh, and there's an election here next year. So these are not sort of innocuous comments. They're coming in a highly charged political context. Um, this is a global election, as, as Francois Hollande said. Americans may vote, but it has global consequences and perhaps nowhere more right now than here in Europe. Well, Matthias, let me turn that to you. Uh, how is Germany reacting to the Trump phenomenon, especially now that uh, Hillary Clinton is the Democratic nominee um, and, and her policies are basically continue, would probably be a continuation of the Obama administration. Uh, how is Germany reacting to this? Yeah, I think it's pretty similar to what my, uh, how, how the situation in France has been, has been described. It was similar to, to America that in the beginning everybody thought it's just a joke that Donald Trump is running and um, he made this one crazy remark and then he will go down and okay but maybe like the next the next comment will will kill him and will stop him from yeah from being the front runner and it just has continued and continued i think what's what makes it so yeah and uh, incomprehensible for european uh citizens is that just the, the german election season is pretty much five or six weeks and uh, we have a much stronger control and influence by the political parties so just like this whole setting that you, that you have someone like a political entrepreneur like Donald Trump, who just goes in, pretty much hijacks a party. Um, now it's kind of like on the verge of hijacking the most powerful country in the world, so to speak. It's just something that it seems totally outlandish. Um, so I think most of the German people, and especially German politicians and diplomats, if you talk with them, they feel that we've been treated pretty well by Obama, even with all, with all the NSA um, spying thing. but. There's a close cooperation. There was a study, I think, done by Pew about a month ago, where German citizens said, uh, or like 86% of German citizens said they have trust in Obama handling world affairs. Uh, Angela Merkel just had 73%, so Obama is more popular than our own chancellor. 
And Donald Trump, he had a stunning number of 6%. So 6% of Germans who were asked at that time, would you trust Donald Trump dealing with international affairs? That was 6%, I think, in June. Probably right now it's more closer to 2 or 3%. So I think um, people pay close attention just because election in the USA is more like a circus and a reality TV show. But the people feel, um, oh boy, please um, don't, don't go that far, America. Don't put, us, put the world to a test. Who you call like uh, reality yeah. TV, that, that might explain the allure yeah. of Donald Trump, who has had a successful reality television show here in America for a while until he started running. Uh, Douglas, I want to get your reaction to um, uh, Mr. Trump's recent comments about NATO. He's been very critical of NATO. Um, he spoke to ABC's George Stephanopoulos uh, last week uh, about how the U.S. is planning to help NATO countries if they have not paid uh, their fair share. Here's the quote. I want to get your reaction on the other side. NATO is going to be just fine, but NATO countries, we have 28 countries, many of them are taking advantage of us because they're not paying. So we're protecting these countries and they're not paying. And when people leave that last part in, everybody agrees with me. I'm all in favor of NATO. I said NATO's obsolete. I was asked a question by one of your competitors and I said NATO's obsolete because it's not taking care of terror. You understand that. And it turned out I was right. A lot of people gave me credit for that. Douglas, your reaction. Yeah. The reaction, well, look, uh, on this end, this really goes right to the jugular of everything that, that Europeans are right now insecure about. You know, you have this sense of world institutions in general, not just NATO, right? The European Union, uh, the, the WTO, um, uh, you know, any global institution, they're under attack from, from Trump right now. Um, they're, they're sort of wobbly. Then you hear him say this, you know, I, I worked 20 years ago uh, in the Baltic states. I was based in Estonia. And, and back then, I, I can't tell you how much Russia was the front and center issue on absolutely everyone's lips. And at the time, Russian troops were still occupying Estonia, even though it was independent. Um, and today, it's very much the very same concerns. And, you know, I think a lot of Europeans would, would challenge Donald Trump to actually locate the Baltic states on a map. Um, you know, we talk about the Baltics, we talk about Poland. I, I think there's a sense here that he has absolutely no um, notion, not even the vaguest idea of what the impact of such a statement is when he talks about that, given the history, the, 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 the recent history, the, the 20th century history um, of the Baltic states with Russia as a neighbor, a neighbor, a, a neighbor which has often been extremely aggressive uh, with them, occupying them for, for many decades. Um, so the comments are, are construed as just proving what, what a lot of Europeans already think about Donald Trump. This is a man who has no grasp or understanding of, of world institutions, of international conventions, of the post-World War II order in treaties, um, and, and just sort of the way the world has worked uh, in the post-war period. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, yes, it's horrifying. And especially what you're hearing, you know, coming out of the Baltics right now. They're petrified, they're astounded, they're horrified, not necessarily in that order. They can't actually believe that a potential president of the United States is really saying these things. Uh, Matthias, let me turn to you. So let's just, I'm going to ask you to look in your crystal ball. Donald Trump wins in November. He's sworn in in January of 2017. How does this affect U.S.-Germany relations, which are pretty solid right now, minus the NSA situation? How does that affect U.S.-EU uh, relations, especially in the wake of Brexit? Um, talk to me about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a pretty tough one because um, I think it's hard to predict what Donald Trump will say uh, this afternoon or um, this upcoming Fair week point. or month. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, I think um, what our what what our chancellor probably will do. I mean, uh, she she decided to act a little, a little bit differently than, than uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hollande. She has totally restrained or just like refused to say anything about Donald Trump, although he has insulted her a number of times. I think he was really angry that she uh, was placed before him uh, in the time election of the person of the year 2015 or something like that. I've been to several Trump events where he has said that just like Germany is at the brink of a revolution and thousands and thousands of Germans are leaving the country just because of the refugee crisis and that, uh, that Merkel is a loser. So. Um, she just kept her cool and decided that he's not worth any comment. So I think if a President Trump would really, really become reality, she would try to work with him, try to educate him. That's kind of like her style. She's not someone who goes out and kind of like yeah challenges someone. Um, and I think they would, I think 
all diplomats of every country probably they would try to build a strong relationship to the people who are advising President Trump on national security, uh, on foreign affairs, and trying to use um, you know, to make their influence heard and trying or, or hoping that that he will kind of like cool down and maybe once he sits in the Oval Office realizes that he should just like, I don't know, count to 10 and take a deep breath before he says anything. But um, I think it will be pretty, pretty, pretty hard. And um, the impression that I had just when uh, President Bush, George W. Bush was president, that was when I was like in my early 20s at that time, the image of the U.S. went down remarkably and uh, people felt like, oh, Americans are kind of stupid and strange. Why did they reelect such a person? That's kind of like the bad side of America, the, the, the Texas cowboy uh, shoot first, think later attitude. And then with Obama coming in, of course, he didn't, he didn't save the world and the U.S., but he was, he's, he's, he's just like the good American that I think most Europeans kind of want to believe in. So, and then if the American electorate decides to, uh, to pick Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, I think like all these old stereotypes, the anti-Americanism that uh, Nigel Farage and Marine Le Pen, all these people are just like, yeah, like banking on and trying to exploit, I think it will come back in full force and it will be really hard for someone like, like me who has been living in the US kind of like tries to sometimes defend or explain uh, America to, to my readers or to Europeans just like to say something how, yeah, just like uh, it's okay to be angry but <laughs> it's kind of hard to be that angry to uh, to really, yeah, put someone in the White House who's just probably not capable and has the right temperament to to take the right decisions or just listen to to advisors. Well, Matthias Kolb, Douglas Herbert, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insight. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. I'm Josh Kranzberg in for Jason McClure. This week, a look at how potential Donald Trump presidency would play around the world. Let's go now to Joyce Karam to talk about reactions in the Middle East to Trump's policies propose, policy proposals. She's the Washington bureau chief for Al Hayat, one of the leading Arab newspapers. Joyce, welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Josh. Um, so I, I want to get right to it. Um, shortly after, I believe it was the San Bernardino attacks, Donald Trump made headlines, as he is wont to do, um, calling for a Muslim ban a uh, ban on all Muslims into the United States. I want to hear him say it, and I'll get your reaction on the other side. Sure. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Now, he's amended that a little bit to say uh, he, what he meant was uh, you know, it'll be from countries that have seen terror attacks recently, but the gist of it is pretty much the same. Simply put, how is how are people in the Middle East, um, whether they're of the Muslim faith or not, how are they reacting to that? Uh, well, Josh, they're mystified. They're puzzled that how someone they know, they many, many leaders know Donald Trump. They've known him as uh, a real estate mogul. They've uh, done business with him. You go to UAE. Uh, Donald Trump has a golf course. Uh, you go to Turkey, there is a hotel, there is new businesses coming up in Qatar. So they know Donald Trump, uh, the businessman. Uh, what they're seeing, uh, I think, on the campaign trail, they're, uh, they're shocked. They, uh, they don't know what to make of it. You know, we're used to this happening in reverse, uh, where the U.S. would be surprised and uh, shocked at developments in the Middle East. Uh, but what you're seeing with uh, Donald uh, Trump is a whole region that's, uh, you know, recalculating. What could this mean if he actually wins on November 8th? Will he really ban uh, Muslims? Will he really go uh, and uh, randomly attack uh, areas in Syria and Iraq? Will he, will he make uh, Syria an ISIS free zone? These are all things that Donald Trump have said, and it's unclear whether uh, he really meant it, or he's just trying to uh, rally his base. One thing I've noticed, you know, talking to uh, Middle Eastern leaders and and average people in the Middle East is uh, really Obama and Hillary Clinton never looked uh, better than they uh, look today. I, I think uh, Obama had his share of criticism and policy in the region and, uh, you know, Syria, ISIS, Iraq. 
uh, Hillary Clinton as well with uh, the Libya, the Libya intervention. But when you contrast uh, both uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton with what we're seeing now, I think um, a lot of people would go for the uh, sanity and stability uh, vote than than uh, you know bet on on Trump. And this is a region that's. You know that dealt with the Bush family. That th there is a lot at stake between the U.S. and and Arab countries. There are military bases. Uh, there is security cooperation. There are three wars going on in the Middle East, Syria. Well, well you Iraq, mentioned you Libya. mentioned the battle against ISIS. I want to get to that. Um, uh, whatever the criticisms may be of the Obama administration and what Hillary Clinton's potential policies against the Islamic State uh, is, Donald Trump has made headlines once again, as usual, um, saying he won't give a fully detailed plan to defeat the Islamic State, saying he wants to surprise them, but he does promise that he will uh, wipe them out. Um, what's the reaction to this um, overseas and and? What could his plan possibly be that's so different than the Obama administration and a potential Clinton administration has? Well, you know, we're as perplexed as uh, the American audience is. Nobody knows what the plan is. The surprise uh, strategy, when he talks more about it, it doesn't look much of a surprise. I mean, he will uh, carry more airstrikes, he said, against ISIS. Well, the U.S. has carried now, the U.S. and the coalition have carried you know, over 10,000 strikes against ISIS. He said he will take the oil. I also don't know what that means. Like, how are you going to drive into Iraq and Syria and take the oil? Are you going to uh, station ground troops on, uh, on the ground in Iraq and Syria? And wouldn't that be playing right into ISIS hands? So, so the whole Trump uh, phenomena is mystifying. There's a lot of question marks. Uh, he changes his mind a lot, like the ban on Muslims. It was a ban on Muslims. Then it was a ban on immigrants from Muslim nations. I also don't know, coming from Lebanon, what that means, because we are not neither a Muslim nation, neither otherwise. But we do have terrorism. Now it's a ban from terrorist nations, which is also very confusing. Who is a terrorist uh, nation? So uh, the, the Middle East is looking at this in shock and now a little bit in fear because, you know, even though it's a 30% chance that he could win, it's out there. And what this could mean to Arab-U.S. relations, I think we'd be entering a whole new uh, phase, a whole new era for U.S. leverage and power in, in, in the Middle East. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about um, the Middle East reaction. I'm not, you know, I, I don't expect you to have a blanket statement for the entire region, but um, Kazir Khan's speech at the Democratic National Convention, um, uh, and then the uh, reaction from Donald Trump, and the backlash, and then the backlash on the backlash. Um, what has been the reaction um, to uh, Mr. Khan's speech, and then the reaction from Donald Trump to the speech? Well, 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 you know, I think this is a watershed moment in the campaign for how we report uh, on the Trump campaign and how the narrative has changed. I mean, seeing a Muslim immigrant uh, with his wife taking that stage and for seven minutes uh, changing the trajectory of uh, of the campaign, I, I think that's that's that is seen as powerful. There is a reminder that someone can actually stand up to Trump and in non-political and non-sophisticated uh, uh, terms and that actually uh, the American public, the vast majority, is, is embracing uh, their story. Uh, of course, you have some in the Middle East who are saying, yeah, but his son died in Iraq. That was a bad war. Uh, for the region, but I think that the bigger, the larger picture of a Muslim immigrant challenging uh, Donald Trump and uh, hurting him and in, in, in the polls and otherwise is is viewed very uh, powerfully and favorably in, uh, in, in the region. It, it has been making headlines. 
Well, Joyce Karam, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate your time. Uh, a reminder, this is Global Journalist. I'm Josh Kranzberg, in for Jason McClure. This week, we go around the world to see how a potential Donald Trump presidency would change things. If you're interested in more Global Journalist content, you can visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There, you can read our ongoing series of interviews with journalists in exile around the world, including coverage of foreign affairs and press freedom issues. We're also on social media. Be sure to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Let's now bring in from Washington, D.C., Jia J. Tang to hear about reactions to Trump in Asia. She's the U.S. Bureau Chief for Sina News in China. Jia J., welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So uh, I want to start with a, another soundbite from Mr. Trump. Um, he has been in the past very anti-China. He made a statement um, a while ago about um, China's the he's accusing China of manipulating its currency. Um, I want to play the soundbite, a quick warning. It is a, a tad bit of strong language, but I want to get your reaction on the other side. When the Chinese traders come in, and they come in 20 at a time, they come in all the way. But when the Chinese come in, and they want to make great trade deals, and they make the best trade deals, and not anymore. When I'm there, we turn it around, folks. We turn it around. We have a $500 billion deficit, trade deficit with China. We're going to turn it around, and we have the cards. Don't forget, we're like the piggy bank that's being robbed. We have the cards. We have a lot of power with China. When China doesn't want to fix the problem in North Korea, we say, sorry, folks, you got to fix the problem. Because we can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. So, uh, like I said, I'll get your reaction. What, have, what has been the reaction from Chinese leaders, from, from, from the Chinese population as a whole? Again, I'm not expecting a blanket statement, but w what's been the reaction to that? Well, to be honest, we've been hearing a lot about China and Trump since he's uh, running for the president. And uh, the Chinese has enjoyed a lot of deliberate finger pointing throughout the US election process from both sides of aisle. So most of the Chinese public feel like China just has a big target on its back. And um, looking at the, the comment and reaction from our audience on the internet or the Weibo, you will be surprised that Hillary actually has more negative review than Trump. I think that's a very interesting thing to see. Why do you think that is? I mean, Donald Trump has has gone time after time. He's railed against Chinese businesses, and and you know the only time he talks favorably about the Chinese is when he's selling them apartment complexes. Um, why is he doing so well, or more important, or more uh, differently? Why is Hillary Clinton not viewed as favorably? Well. The first thing come pop into mind when Chinese think about Trump is his reality show, Trump Tower, and his business background. So he's entertaining and fun to watch. As, as an outsider watching American's election, you know, Chinese always get these short clips of sight on Weibo of his wilder moment. And um, even Trump Tower even become a, a selfie location for China, Chinese tourists. The, this fun to watch mentality is obviously a big contrast to Hillary, who they see as a very serious woman, a lawyer, focusing on her position and um, official stance. So I'm not I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it sounds to me like like Chinese leaders and, and the Chinese population, they they know that Hillary Clinton would probably be better for them in terms of global relations. But Donald Trump, they they want him because they can take him less seriously. Uh, I think I will agree with Joyce on that because Trump has been so vague on his foreign policy. I definitely sense uh, anxiety from the Chinese government on trying to figure out his foreign policy. But so far as we know that Hillary is strong on South China's issue, she's hard on human rights issue, while Trump we just still trying to figure out. I'm glad you mentioned the South China Sea, one of Trump's uh vague policies that you mentioned. He said he would expand the U.S.'s military presence in the South China Sea. Um, that's become a hot issue recently, especially after China's dispute with the Philippines. What's been the reaction in, in China uh, about that statement? Mm, I would say, again, it's not a new thing. We About the South China Sea and about the finger pointing from, from America, it's Chinese people are getting used to it. Like, again, 
uh, it's another candidate blaming us on what we're doing in South China Sea. So I didn't see the 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 the, pop, uh, the Chinese people react very uh, huge on that issue. Um, another issue, I feel like I'm just going down the laundry list of uh, things here that he said. He wants mm -hmm. to um, arm Japan and South Korea with nuclear weapons. Obviously, China and Japan, a very, very contentious history. That's even an understatement. Um, what has been the reaction from uh, his statement that he wants to arm Japan with nuclear weapons? That statement actually swears me. And uh, just about every family has suffered through war, including Chinese. This family member has told them about the difficulty, the terror of war. I think the idea of non-nuclear world is one of the most people agree with. So when Trump repeatedly declined to rule out the use of nuclear weapon and even saying giving Japan um, the nuclear weapon to defend themselves without the US, um, it set a scary president, and I know that worries me. Uh, another reason why he said he wanted to arm Japan and South Korea was because of North Korea. Um, he recently received what amounts to an endorsement from North Korea and Kim Jong-un. Um, has that been viewed at uh, negatively, or is that just sort of brushing aside you know, North Korea, or, or how has that been taken? Yeah, it's definitely got make get viral on the, the internet and Weibo. But I, I think most of people are getting used to see all these crazy and wild movement or statement from Trump and from North Korea even. Do you think Hillary um, is considered unpopular, going back to that, um, because she has been so outspoken about the South China Sea with concrete plans uh, and about China's human rights uh, issues and women's rights issues? Do you think that's why the general population um, sort of views her less favorably maybe than, than Trump? Yes, definitely. Yeah, because just because people have so much memory about of dealing with Hillary when she was the first lady, she delivered the the um, uh, woman right is human right in Beijing. The state, um, the, when she was secretary of state, she strong pivot to Asia policy and uh, South China Sea policy. So with about um, 45 seconds left, I'm going to ask you to look in inside your crystal ball. Donald Trump's elected president in November. He's sworn in in January. What are U.S.-China relations going to look like um, in a Donald Trump presidency? Well, I, I, I think the world is, will still go on. It's not like Trump is going to be a true dictator. There are still checks and balancing plays in the Congress. So, but the Trump's rhetoric about China's role in all that is the thing that worries me. It's a, it's huge oversimplification. We are losing job, China's fault. Factories are closing, China's fault. These are complex um, global issues we're talking about here. And China and U.S. do not exist in a vacuum. I think this will definitely um, stifle improvement in, in Sino-U.S. relations. Well, that'll do it for this edition of Global Journalists, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Douglas Herbert, Matthias Cole, Joyce Krom, and Jia Jie Tang for joining us. Our senior producers this week are Jing Han Chen and Javila Ruskaskate. Our studio director is Travis McMillan of the Reynolds Journalism Institute, and our audio engineer is Pat Akers of KBIA Columbia, Missouri. For all of us here at Global Journalists, I'm Josh Kranzberg. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.